And uh, the more I uh, explore, the more I realize the tragedy called modernity. Modernity essentially is a movement against life. And you could hear from uh, what she was talking about. Uh, we seem to be celebrating it. It's like this, that the way we celebrate a bonsai tree. No? <laughs> the way we celebrate a bonsai tree. The bonsai tree is formed when the roots are cut. You know this? So that is how it is. So uh, let me put it in very simple words. Um, modernity is about learning the word, W-O-R-D. Tradition is about learning the word, W-O-R-L-D. So, modern men are essentially removed from their beingness, biological beingness. They are uprooted from their culture, alienated. So naturally we turn against nature. Because we kill the nature right in us. What is nature? Nature is the essential biological aspect of our being. Learning is the nature of life, but not education. Modern education is anti-life. So, I won't take too much time. Uh, you know, at NID, I realized that whole education is nothing but recolonization. And uh, now it uh, seems to have kind of uh, stabilized. That people don't even know that they are colonized. That's the situation today. Um, and uh, Essentially, we have been celebrating our mediocrity all this while and we are making it even worse to Just think of this, that your whole education, you go to any institution in this country, you go to any architectural institution in this country, and if they are teaching you the same aesthetic sense, the same basic design, and that too from a book developed in Europe, can you do anything different? What is happening is nothing but just homogenization of human beings. All cities look alike. Uh, we don't seem to be having any problem with that. Culture is something else. Don't talk about culture. Because culture essentially means there has to be an autonomy in the being. When you are an engineer, right from that time you come out of your you know, mother's home, you are, you are continuously being engineered to think in a certain manner. Can there be any education, any culture after that? It's an absurd idea to think that we have anything called culture. Because culture is an essential engagement with your context. And from that context, in spontaneity you create things. So, I have been actually studying uh, this for many years. I um, after I left NID, I started uh, working with rural tribal communities, and I realized that they actually are the true rooted people. Whereas educated Indians are, a friend very jokingly says, we are we are uh, resident non-Indians. Not the MRIs, but the resident non-Indians. We are completely uprooted from our being through this process called education. Think about it sometime. <laughs> See, we are all born original beings. Am I right? But none of us carry anything original here because it's all being conditioned. Let me ask you a simple question. What is the color of sky? Fast please, you are educated. Answer. Blue, okay, fantastic. Now this is what education does to you. It tells you it is blue and you believe it. And the more you are educated, the more you are certain about it. You ask a child. The child, if that actually happened, I keep doing this with every gathering I go. I have no doubt that educated people will answer me this question. Blue, 
color of leaf is green, it's all fixed. This is education for you. <laughs> you know? But we have a fantastic mask to tell us that we are very educated. And we continue to believe in this nonsense. This is the tragedy. So, actually, my work with the rural tribal communities has been precisely to learn from them, not to teach them anything. And uh, um, in my... Yeah, I will do it fast. I will, I will just give you some basic idea about what really happens in education, what really happens in modernity. Modernity, the knowledge changes from nature to human. I call them today human beings are become human knowings. We seem to be preoccupied in knowledge, but we have lost how to live. We have forgotten to live, to be. Uh, because we are always being fed information from outside. And uh, from collective to individual, from heart to intellect and mind, from intuition to reason. Because for intuition to function, your reasoning has to stop. All your education is about rationality, am I right? Isn't that we celebrate? Rationality, reasoning. See, they keep telling that no memory is bad, so you should reason to understand. Am I right? Then how can there be any creativity if you are only involved in reasoning? See, the whole learning process is about uncovering the unknown. Am I right? In uncovering the unknown, that is the only place where intuition can happen. When you are dealing with what is known, intuition has no role. Only reasoning has a role. No? So, I mean, this is slightly long, so just let me... So, I will go directly into, into this uh, thing called uh, reimagining learning from learning from teaching paradigm to learning paradigm. See, first time when I went to NID, I realized a place where people learn. Everywhere else I found teaching. It's a very different kind of a setup. First time I realized that things can happen when there is no teacher allowed, you know, like, you know. But this is strange because none of us have ever seen such a situation. The whole school was nothing but teaching, child, not teacher, teaching, teaching, teaching. And you are memorizing. That's all. So that is from where I began to really look at what is a learning paradigm, not a teaching paradigm. And when I began to work with rural family in communities, I began to study children, how children learn. One fundamental difference I found with modernity and tradition is that in tradition there is no teaching. In tradition there is a fundamental trust in life that like learning happens. There is no parenting there. Children just grow without any, you know, anyone telling you what to do. This all may sound very strange to you. I have mean, not really seen any of these things. But I, you know, I actually uh, very, uh, what do you call it, systematically documented what I am talking about. I began to really engage with what children do actually. You know, children actually learn the world the way it is. Right? I want to ask you, suppose a child is sitting on that kind of a chair. What would the child do? This chair, in front of you. Can you guess? What would the child do sitting on a chair like that? Hmm? One person, just tell anybody who. Take a guess. Would it speed up? Huh? Would it speed up on the chair? No, 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 sitting on that chair. That chair, that chair. What would the child do? You lost your childhood? Be a child? You want to just sit and see what will the child do? Try it out? <laughs> Huh? Precisely. Any child who is sitting on a sofa would do this, right? Have you seen uh, in, in um, airports and places like that, even uh, railway stations, 
there now with the steel chair like this. Do you know what a child does sitting on that? Do you know what happens to you when you sit on that? Have you noticed? When you sit on those steel chairs, what happens to you? You begin to slide. Have you seen this? You can't sit there. And I have seen any time a child sits there, the child will enjoy the sliding. You understand? You see, I find the possibility, the best possibility of design education and architectural education is that in your foundation program, if it is done well, you can reclaim the child in you. But there is the only possibility for becoming children again. But that's the, the, this is the only course that gives you possibility of creativity. Uh, uh, civil engineering or any other subject doesn't have any role for uh, one's own creativity. So what actually a child does is to learn the way the world is actually, the world itself. Well, it's, it's a very long subject, so I won't, you know, I won't really be able to do much justice to this. So this is what I actually offer as a new term. This is what is really happening in modernity. What is happening is engineered. People are being engineered. They are being conditioned to think in a certain way and believe that they have knowledge. It's a belief system. It's a plain belief system. You are only reasoning to again believe what somebody is telling you. Uh, it is interesting that in in a, you know uh, in indigenous communities there is more work and in traditional I mean in modern communities there is more nouns because we are actually you know dealing with language and when we are dealing with language language is fundamentally noun. Oh, understand? The act of running, for example, I'm taking an example. The act of running. Right? And we calling that act a name. Wouldn't that become now? Right? So, we get this. Language, the very structure of language is explaining something. It's not life itself. It's a description. It's a naming process. Um, So basically what I began to study is what I call as the cognitive damages that modern uh, modernity does to us and the actual biological roots of knowing, biological roots of being. Um, and, uh, and what happens is that in, in modernity the mind directly engages with the knowledge in the human body. It's like this, that when, when I asked you what is the color of sky, everybody was certainly it's blue, right? Nobody had a doubt. And then uh, there are also more and more writings on it telling that by Sibi Raman, no? Why is the sky blue? Right? Have you seen a book? Why is the sky blue? We are not asking, is the sky blue? Or when is the sky blue? The same question asked to a child, the child asked that, what time of the day are you talking about? If the child has a bit more freedom, the child will go out and look at the sky. I, even in places where you can see the sky, I find people don't look up at all to answer this question. Because we are always in the mind. We are not present to the world. Learning is a process of being present to the world. Education makes you absent. All theories are fitting. So basically in this whole thing there is no villain, I mean, the whole context is like that. And this process is very new, it's just a 500 year process. The process that began in Germany, a place called Gutenberg, when the, where the first uh, printing press was established. You know that, uh, Gutenberg revolution is called in history. So in 500 years Europe transformed itself into what is now today known as Western culture. Western culture is a thought culture, mental culture, mind culture. 
So that is why Descartes has a famous saying that I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. That's a basic paradigm of modernity. Whereas if you look at the whole traditional knowledge system, up, even in the Vedas, we call it Darshanam. Am I right? Have you heard that thing? Darshanam meaning seeing, ability to see. But the seeing is not a once in a while process. You are rooted in seeing. You are constantly present to the world. And all children are like that. All children are continuously present to the world. But as you begin to engage with the mind, you become absent. Don't you know that today, the way most of us are, we are physically present often but mentally absent. Am I right? Have you noticed this? We are not present to that situation. So this is a, uh, you know, this is a... Let me just show you certain things that, uh, you know, how children learn. Actually, play is the way children learn. And I tell you that, uh, uh, you know, how damaging modernity is to children is by creating a toy for the child. Because children do not want toys at all, basically. They are playful. They are not looking for a toy. They are playful. When a child is sitting on that chair and jumping, are they playing? Are they using that as a toy? Anything, anytime. The moment a child walks into a space like this, like this, you know, this kind of a ground, the child will slide. Have you seen it? The child will come, they will start to slide. So they are basically exploring the materiality of the world. What is the material? What is it offer? So they explore the materiality of the world. They try to understand what is the form, how does thing look. Right? I don't know in childhood whether you have a good As children, I don't know whether you have, you have done this and said this is a house. Have you done this? Yeah? I have studied this very, very systematically. How does a child explore the way things look? So what actually a child does is to explore the way the world looks. This is learning. Then it begins to explore how do you do things. Have you made houses like this? Do you remember making houses using books? Right? You put two, three books together, put the book, book on top. Have you built that like that? So this is a very natural process of understanding what is the world around. This is learning. This is not study. This is learning. Learning has to do with the three-dimensional world. Not with the two-dimensional world. Learning is a process of understanding how does the world function. What it constitutes of. What is the form. What is the property of materials. Right? I mean, actually, this is what we uh, in design schools learn in the first thing, you know. So these are just some examples of how children explore things. None of it is given to them. Making toy was part and parcel of the process of a childhood. Continuous exploration. You know, the day he saw me shooting, immediately they made two cameras. So what they see is what they want to make. So there is always a formal connection between this. And of course this is an exploration of how, you know, the rules of physics, all that you can see in this. You know, this is a... A 13, 12 year old boy who did this. I mean, I have a whole documentation of houses he made from the age of 5 up to the age of 12. Constantly exploring, uh, you know, various ways in which they can make house. So this is basically the kind of uh, paradigm. See, when I go to design schools, when I, you know, work with my students, what I constantly feel is that if I work with 50 students, I teach in a manner that these 50 students become my teachers. 
No? So I have nothing ready made to give. <laughs> it's an exploration like that. Is it possible? So then there is no teacher in that in that situation. There are only learners. So this is the you know basic difference between uh, uh, these uh, two paradigms. One is of control, other one is of uh, you know awakening. So just go around in this in, in this country, go to the villages, and you wonder why are they so different from each other? What is that makes it different? Where is the where is the learning process in that? So I mean, this is what actually happens. We learn the word instead of the world. We learn to use reason, which is not a cognitive tool. See, reasoning is an argumentative tool. It is not a cognitive tool. Do you get this? Are you getting it? It's a very simple thing, but I don't know. So what actually happens is that from religious superstition you become scientific superstitious, that's all. You just replace your gods. Now you believe in Einstein and Newton. I mean, what do you know actually? What do I know? We just believe in them. Only just, you know, we have changed the replaced the people. But of course we won't understand you know, believe in this because we think they're very educated. Right? You know, a friend was telling me good uh, Definition of a good student and a bad student. A bad student is someone who forgets before the exam, and a good student is someone who forgets after the exam. <laughs> You're familiar? No, what do you remember? Yeah? 7 standard, 8 standard, 9 standard, 10 standard, anything that you remember? <laughs> then why do we still claim that we are educated? Be honest, at least be honest. You see, this mediocrity can only stop. When you are fundamentally honest with yourself, don't fool yourself at least. You can cheat anybody else, but at least don't cheat yourself. Be fundamentally honest to yourself. You know? So today we have a culture of copying. Copying is the only thing that we are, we are learning. We are never learning to be creative. Just tweaking here and there is not creativity. Please don't think like that. This is what we think today. Creativity is a much more of fundamental quality of the being. A being that is open, a being that is, uh, it's a quality, it's not a, it's not a skill. Today it is learned as a skill, it's a quality. We are born with this quality of being creative. So what really happens is this, what I call as an ontological reversal. Knowledge precedes knowing. There's too much theory now, so let me just leave it. So I just share with you just some, some small things that I did with a group of children where they actually made me realize what is their real potential. And I, I repeated many of the design, uh, you know, basic design courses, programs that I did at NID. So, and the, what was happening was that here, luckily I didn't have too much money. So, I was able to buy only the basic primary colors, six colors. White, black, yellow, green, you know, just that. There was no browns at all. And I found that children were, all of them were able to mix and match and make these colors. And I just got them to get brown colors from the nature, from the, you know, and just made a color sheet from that. You see, what happens is that this kind of exercises makes you see your surroundings. It begins to make you look at leaves, at plants, at you know, just leaves that are there on the on the ground. None of this is plucked from the tree. And again, all this is from those primary colors. Now, this is very interesting that um, uh, you know I did a workshop with a group of teachers in Hyderabad where I gave them the same, repeated the same problem. I gave them just this primary colors and I asked them to do it and hardly anybody could do it because they have not learned it or they were using a reasoning mind to, understand, to do this. So I had also called in all the ayas and the drivers and all the ayas and the drivers were able to mix and match and get these colors. Primarily because an educated mind is always a verifying mind, it is not a discovering mind. It has learned something, it will begin to verify. 
it will begin to reason to see how to solve that. Whereas a mind that is not being conditioned in that manner, it's always a learning mind. Of course, there are much more deeper, uh, you know, aspects of learning that uh, that that has been completely gone from us, which is that. Uh, in the process of learning, how is the whole body involving, involving um, understanding this? A simple thing is that how measurement has gone out of our body. <coughs> because in a traditional society, even here, even in, in, in kitchens today, you would find that people still guess things, you know, how much salt, how much this thing, it's a, it's a result of guessing. But a very highly educated person will fail to do it, but they need measurement, exact measurement. No, I, I, I had a friend, an American friend, who would keep the egg for boiling and then she's looking at the watch. Three minutes, it's out. You know? So all our craft, let me tell you, all our craft is based on, all the traditional knowledge system is based on measurement which is coming with the body. You know, it's part of the body, it's sensing. Actually, when a potter makes a pot, when he tastes clay, he would there's already a kind of a understanding whether this is this will work. Suppose it's a new clay, new pot he's making. You know, first time you hold it, sense it in his hand, and then makes it. Then he realizes that he needs less. He do it. And two times, three times he does it, then this is get embedded in him. He knows. And for making this, this is the clay required. So actually the body, whole body, it's not a mental act. The whole body is involved in this. And this is what actually happens in the kitchen. Almost all the activity that are happening in the kitchen is the result of sensing, feeling, knowing. It is not a mental act. And also the whole issue of composition. You know, there was, you know, in, in my methods, I call it do nothing methods. No teaching at all. I become a good pion there. I only give things and get away from them. So I found that invariably children were able to design things. This is just a 12, 12 year old, 10, 12 year old. But the composition was very, very natural to them. So this is an area, very, very important area that requires uh, fundamental research. That how is beauty a part of a being? It's not something that you have to learn. You see, the, we are born with uh, what I call as the uh, integral nature of aesthetic cognitive structures. If we have the ability to see, what we see is beauty. But the problem is that this is not being fine-tuned. This is never being worked properly. So, what I'm also trying to say is that beauty is an integral, like hunger. Hunger is a biological thing, right? Likewise, beauty is fundamentally biological. It's a very internal need of the being to organize. But this is not to do art. Just to live, you need this kind of quality. So I just wanted to show you some of the things that children did with no help at all. So this is what actually motivated me to really look at children much more deeply. This happened in 2003, up to 2006-07. Every, every uh, holidays, April, May, I work with about 60 children. And each time, it's a surprise for me that how, uh, how much devotion they have in their work, how much autonomous they are, how much independent they are in, in their in this thing. So, I will also quickly show you some basic work I did with uh, um, you know, uh, non literate people, when I started working with artisans also, I had the same kind of process, no teaching, just leave them alone. So, I mean, this is the kind of work that not everyone can do it, but there are people who can do things like this. She has never been to school. And this again is done by 13, 14 year old children with no support at all. You see, craft basically is a process of the hand. And if you are, if from childhood, if you have been using your hands to do things, then you will be fundamentally intelligent in your whole being. Intelligence is not a mental trick. This is what most people think. It's a being, whole being is engaged in that. That is the reason why 
uh, Ashish was talking about the, how the people are able to do these things because essentially there is an intelligent being which is intact, you know, which you don't get it in an urban kind of scenario. So even what we did, new things were always taken inspiration from what is the surroundings. So I did work here for about uh, almost 15 years, 16 years in a village where I did a lot of experiments with uh, working on clay. Different kinds of experiments, huge murals to huge landscape products to very high quality uh, pottery, earthenware. So, well, you know, see, the thing is that uh, since I am talking about something very fundamentally uh, different from what you have been hearing, uh, it will be quite difficult to even kind of, uh, you don't have to agree with me, I, I mean that I am absolutely not looking at. But I feel that, uh, you know, this, this kind of things takes real time to explore. So quickly I will show you some few basic things that I began to do with the, the uh, you know, foundation studies, both in architecture and design. Uh, aesthetic sense is something that can be conditioned or can be awakened, number one. Second, aesthetic sense can be developed from reading a book by looking at a book or looking at a context. You see the difference? All traditional cultures have developed their aesthetic sense by engaging with their real context. That is why there is diversity in, in, the, in, the, in the forms that they make. So what, one thing very important that can be, and by the way, the meaning of education is to induce, means to draw out, not to condition. This is the modern version. In fact, even the meaning of theory, you have a word called theory, no? Right? What is the meaning of theory? 500 years ago, theory meant actually what you saw, what you experienced. You see, what has been completely changed, you know, with the way, uh, you know, things are now happening. Education is actually drawing out. It's not giving in. And of course, this is uh, the unique feature of all of us, to be authentic. We are born authentic. And uh, cultural mindfulness is part of this. It's not something that uh, you can acquire by reading books and things like that. It's actually an experience of what you do. Your culture is what you actually experience. Not written down by somebody. But what you are essentially is what is your experience, your culture, what you are. So if you have an ability, if you are, what you are engaged in is copying, then your culture is of copying. And, 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 uh, and uh, people come together and all of them begin to copy, then we have a culture of copy. So this is what Great India is all about today, no? Just copying, imitating the West, left, right and center. And then we still say we are great. I mean, I don't understand this. Anyway, celebrate it. So, um, so the whole exercise was basically to essentially look at what is uh, around your surroundings, nature, So the basic thing is basically how do you begin to observe your surroundings? That is a, you know, and imagine what is already there in you, uh, in your being as beauty. So whether it is color, whether it is, you know, color scheme, whether it is all that, it is very, uh, quite easy to actually engage with your own surroundings and develop these courses. This doesn't require any, uh, you know, book kind of input because this actually has to do with your own experience of the world that you are engaging with. 
So, well, I like it here. It's too much. <laughs>